We got to start with the Shohei stuff, dude, because uh, I actually think that yesterday was the most intriguing way for him to go about this, right? Because had he actually just said, yeah, you know what? I like to wager on some games and I thought it was legal. We did it in legal states. I would have gone, yeah, this is who cares, you know, because I don't care. Let me just put it out here very, very clearly. I do not care if Shohei Otani legally bet on other sports. You know why? I do it every single day, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't see anything wrong morally. Obviously, if he had bet on baseball games, and especially ones that he had been a part of by, like, Pete Rose, then it would be a massive, massive, massive controversy. But if it's the other stuff, which it seems like they don't have any proof that he that there was any involvement in baseball then I kind of think who cares? That's why I'm almost thinking he's innocent because to me, I don't really understand why he wouldn't just say he kind of covered losses, but the back and forth and the questions that need to be answered, which is one, if this really was, you were scot-free from this, how did he gain access to your accounts? And if he did gain access to your accounts, like people are like, Oh, it's a millionaire. And he's, of course you can lose millions of dollars and not notice. I'm like, Yeah, except for the banks look out for you in this regard. Like, you can't just wire transfer a million dollars and your bank is like, who cares? He's rich. That's not how it works. Um, They have mechanisms in place to protect you. And also, you would assume that Shohei Otani has a financial team that would also be looking after his accounts because, you know, he's got to pay the bills and do the like everything that he's involved in. He's not doing that. So they all missed it. What's the weirdest part of this to you? Like, where, where did you land after yesterday in the Shohei stuff? I'm, well, I believe him after yesterday. Oh, it's hard. Because, well, he just exposed himself to such severe liability. Yeah, if he's lying, right? Oh. Like this is there's a federal investigation going on. So, for him to come out and excuse, uh, accuse Ipe of what he accused him of, I mean, it, they, like he is exposing himself to all kinds of liability by doing that. If he's if he's lying. Like mm-hmm. if he's doing so falsely. So he must be very convicted and very confident in the fact that he is telling the truth. Otherwise, I assume he's dealing with attorneys on this. He must be. Mm-hmm. There's there's no way an attorney would allow him to go out and do that unless it wasn't the, you know, unless it was the 100% absolute concrete truth. Okay. Can I prevent one counter argument to that? Of course. This guy is, how long has he been the most face, uh, famous baseball player on earth? And like, or let's put it th- actually this way. A you decade? Know, yeah. Okay. So it's been a decade. Um, how long has it been since you think he lived like a normal life? Ooh. Uh, yeah. Longer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So sometimes people in those positions can feel untouchable. Wouldn't you say? Sure. And I don't think that's the case. Okay. Here, yeah. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying one way or the other, but this does kind of reek a little bit to me, or at least it could reek a little bit to me, like a guy who is so concerned with his image and does not want to have it tarnished whatsoever that he actually would take a position like that because he goes, no, I- I'm not having my name disgraced whatsoever. I am above the law. I've already got this guy bought into taking the fall here. <laughs> like we've got him, his family, wherever they are, they're set for life somehow. There's, you know, the, the silence has been bought and he's going to take the fall. No further questions at this time. He broke into my account. We just got to figure that part out. I just, it's the second part of it. It's the, I think they could figure out a way for them to say how he gained access to the accounts. I just don't know how they're going to be able to say he didn't trip any mechanisms. That's the part to me that once they answer it, I can start believing, but I just don't know how anyone's meant to believe that that could happen. You kind of made the point earlier, like with the size of the wire transfers that we're dealing with here, just with like the scale yeah. of this, there's there's going to be a, a paper trail. There's It's going to be easy, I think, for authorities to get to the bottom of what exactly happened here via their investigations. So I think it would be an enormous risk to go out and lie um, if he was yesterday. Like, I just cannot, I can't see him doing that. Like, it yeah. would make more sense just to say nothing, right? It's not like he came out and just, like, denied um, what had been said. He came out and accused Ipe of mm-hmm. things, um, so which have not been proven in a court of law, which have not been proven by an investigation yet. So to me, like taking that step, I mean, that that spoke volumes to me. Like mm-hmm. the other thing I would pre- present, you kind of said like, yeah, when's the last time he had a, a normal life, et cetera. That's true. Like 
professional athletes can often be naive to a lot of like everyday normal things. That's why like, and not just athletes, even just like celebrities, that's why a lot of them get scammed. Like yeah. there's, you know, Google it. Like there's a ton of really famous people who have been scammed by people really close to them who they trusted. And sometimes it is because they aren't quite as, um, they don't quite have their backs up as much or they aren't quite as, uh, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Like they aren't quite as just like, you know, they they aren't looking out for these things yeah. the way that, that you and I might be. Okay. So here's, here's the other part of it too. And I'll wrap this up and we'll get into Jay stuff, but I do find it fascinating. Okay. So Here's the timeline of when the ESPN started to report the story, right? And I was reading this from ESPN.com. So they got documents that showed Otani's name on a $1 million wire transfer that was uh, sent to that allegedly uh, illegal bookie, right? That was under federal investigation. Then they asked Otani's people about it. And then, uh, then it was uh, Mizuhura, is how you say his name? Uh, Ipe yeah. Mizuhara. Mizuhara. Okay. Goes, That's yeah. when Otani's people got back to ESPN and were like, hey, he willingly paid off the gambling debts. And it was like a big story. And then uh, there was the Mizuhara saying that he had the gambling problem. Like, that's the timeline of events here. I would have more faith that this was open and shut. Shohei was not taking the risk that we're talking about if I didn't feel as though everything from his side has been fumbled from the outset of this. Like I just have such a hard time understanding why there was the back and forth, how Ipe was able to be basically like the, um, the voice for Shohei Otani without any consultation with anybody else or how things he would be saying other people in his orbit wouldn't be all over it going, wait, that's not true. Um, I don't know. It doesn't seem like Shohei has the best agent in sports. Uh, let's just put it that way. I, I don't think that the, deal. what, yeah, he got him a, great, got him a lot of money. Yeah. He got him a lot of money. Uh, I, here's what I would say. Do you think this story happens if Scott Boris is his agent? I don't think so. Not like this. I don't think it's going down like that. It's just, it's been pretty disorganized, discombobulated and yeah, frankly, poorly done. And so that's the part, that's the reason why I'm, I'm still, as much as you're right, the risk, the risk element is, okay, he's got to be innocent or he's got to feel as though he's going to be untouchable in this situation. There's so many questions that still remain unanswered that don't feel like they're easy cut and dry answers that I, I'm not ready to let go of this. That's where I'm at. Well, I, th I think a lot of those questions are tied back to like the initial response to this yeah. as it was all coming out, right? Like that you're referring to. And yeah, absolutely. Like it was super clumsy the way that it was handled at first. I wonder, I would speculate whether Shohei and Ipe were receiving the level of counsel that they are now at that time. Mm -hmm. They may have just tried to handle this on their own um, or maybe with some folks who didn't really know what they're doing. I don't know, I'm speculating, but what I am reasonably certain of now is that Shohei has some uh, very intelligent outside counsel at this time. Yeah. Like he must be <laughs> dealing with attorneys. Uh, and so I just can't imagine that anybody would advise him to do what he did yesterday. Uh, you know, if they weren't absolutely certain that it, it, it was truthful, like he could easily like yeah. he could so easily just not make statements about this. Just say, hey, I'm going to let investigations play out. Yeah. We'll let this process go and we'll talk about it afterwards. But I can't really talk right now for him yeah. to go up on a podium yesterday and accuse somebody of what he accused them of. Like to me, that is a significant step and opens him up to an amount of liability that would just there's no reason to take that on unless you're being truthful I, again though we've seen this with celebrities before this has happened where they lie publicly because they think they're going to get away with something and then the rest ends up happening so i'm just saying that this would not be the first time someone decided to go and take a bold action to try to clear their name and image in hopes that it was going to work out only for to have it backfire. All I'm saying is that. If, it, he, if he was lying yesterday, the consequences would be severe. And yeah. the story will escalate in a very <laughs> serious way. <laughs> As someone who, you know, will never get over him not playing in the city of Toronto. I'm, kind of, I'm not rooting for it to be that way. But oh, that's the schadenfreude. Yeah. Right? I'm not rooting for it to be that way. But yeah, it's like, I won't be heartbroken about it if he turned out to be a liar and a fraud. And yeah. Yeah, like, but he's still going to hit like 40 bombs this year. Sure, like, sure the will. Guy, he, the guy, on the day that he learned he had to have Tommy John surgery, he mm -hmm. like went out and had a homer in like a three hit night. Mm -hmm. Like he is such an exceptional athlete. Yeah, like, I right. would not be surprised if this does not impact his performance in the slightest. Mm -hmm. Or it's the first time that he's had something distract him from baseball. A guy who, again, in the old Arden piece was 
just basically going from his hotel to the ballpark and didn't want to be disturbed by anything, any thought other than baseball. Uh, all he wanted to do was focus on mechanics and nutrition. And all of a sudden he's got this on his plate and he's never dealt with this before. And mm, who knows, you know, like maybe, maybe he struggles. It's uh so it's a mental game, Arden. It's a mental game. Uh, it's okay. not the bet that I would want to make. Yeah. That Shohei Otani's going to struggle. <laughs> yeah, but you're I would his not close want to be on that side. Friend. Of you're it. his personal friend. You're like basically <laughs> after Ipe, it's you. You know, you're the you're the guy oh. who spent the second most time with him up close and personal, going back to his basically, uh, yeah, his his Japanese baseball days. Might need to distance myself in that case. Uh, Correct. Correct. Right uh, okay. So let me start with this. Uh, it seems like things really went well with Gossman, touching what ninety five, ninety six. Um, is he going to make his, like, obviously not his first start because he would have been their opening day guy, but is he going to get skipped? How, how does this play out with Gossman? Where is he at with the health? Yeah, he looked tremendous. Like mm-hmm. he looked like mid season Kevin Gossman, which is not what I was expecting mm-hmm. in his first like game action of spring and having had the protracted run up that he's had. I mean, like he was just vaporizing dudes. Mm-hmm. Like it was, you know, every pitch for a strike, the splitter was amazing. Like it was, it was funny talking to him afterwards and he actually like, wasn't that happy with his splitter. And I was like, what's a good splitter to you? Mm-hmm. If that wasn't a good one. I mean, he didn't feel like it was really carrying the zone way, the way he needed it to, but it was upper eighties and getting swing and miss. And it was there for a strike. And he also executed actually some really good fastballs into lefties. Like that's a huge pitch for him just to keep lefties from hanging out over the plate so i would expect that he's gonna be in the first turn of the blue jays rotation Mm -hmm. um my belief is they want him in game four against the rays Mm -hmm. they want to keep him away from the astros so i think that if like if he reports to the complex today and he feels well and checks all the boxes i think they're going to try to get him lined up for sunday against the rays but they could also have, you know, if they want to give him the extra day, they could throw down Francis on Sunday and, and have Gosman open up the Astros series. Okay. And so my read on the, so they got three guys that are entering or sorry. Well, I guess four cause Danny Jansen, but three uh, pitchers that are going to be entering the season on the aisle Romano and Swanson. I think that was a, a bit of a surprising reveal for some of us because it seemed as though maybe they, they were going to end up being okay ish, but is your general read on this that neither guy is going to miss a significant amount of time? Like, how concerned are you with the two relievers? Like, I'm not including Manoa in this. Let's we'll we'll save that for next. Well, they're going to miss some time because, mm. and it's weird that the Blue Jays have been as sly as they've been about yeah. this. Like, they they still haven't even officially like acknowledged that these guys are going to be on the IL to start the season. Uh, but the season starts in two days. Like they're going to be on the IL to start the season. I don't know why the Blue Jays are doing this the way that they are, but these are two guys who haven't been off a mound in around two weeks now. And the word yesterday was they might not be off a mound until next week. So they're going to have to restart Ooh. their buildups. And that starts with like a mound session. And then you've got to face hitters in a controlled environment, whether that's like a live VP or sim game. And then you typically need like at least one outing in the minors on a rehab assignment, maybe even two. So yeah, we're talking a matter of weeks. Like these are not guys who are going to be back in the first two weeks of the regular season, in my opinion. Like this is going to be at the earliest like in that first home stand the jays have um after the long road trip when they've got seattle colorado new york mm. maybe somewhere in there but this could very well extend into mid-april yeah that's crazy because the way that this read all along was nothing to see here don't worry about it super precautionary but ultimately fine so yeah wh- why would they be this way when yeah trying to push like we're trying to report these injuries it's, it's tough in spring training because there isn't technically an active roster. So you mm-hmm. don't technically have to put anybody on injured list. Like you don't actually have to announce any injuries. So mm-hmm. that's why like every day, whether it's me or it's Hazel or it's Shy or whoever, like we are asking John Schneider, hey, this guy didn't play yesterday. What's going on with that? Hey, mm-hmm. we haven't seen that guy for a couple of days. What's going on with this? Because if you don't actually press them on this stuff, they don't have to reveal anything in spring. Mm. During the regular season, they have to reveal some things because they have a legit active roster. But during the spring, they don't have one. So look at the Joey Votto situation. He steps on a bat and the word from the club is, yeah, it'll just be a day. You mm. know, he just needs a day to get back. Well, here we are a week later and he hasn't started baseball activity. So in spring, you can definitely be a bit more covert with the injury stuff. Uh, but once the season starts, that's no longer the case. Mm. So we have uh, our sister station here that we're beside in the studio I use, uh, which is now rebranded to 680 News Radio Toronto. 
That's the new branding of that. I think I, I tried to do that as pro as possible. I was listening to them do it this morning. I was like, that's pretty good. It's pretty professional. You nailed it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, brother. But I was asked. The people there's gathering around. They're like, what's up with Manoa? And I went, can I be honest with you? I don't really know. It's been pretty quiet around Manoa. Uh, a lot of Bowden Francis buzz. That's been, you know, pushed out nonstop. Bowden Francis looking good. Bowden Francis, story of spring. Bowden Francis, actually better than you think. Don't sleep on Bowden Francis. We get it. We get it. We get it. But what is the latest with Alec Manoa? Because when we went into this thing and I had you into preview spring, we agreed that he was clearly the biggest story going into spring training. And I don't know, things seemingly couldn't have gone worse. And now what is like, what is the plan here? What is the the word around where Alec Manoa is going to be, when he's going to be there and yeah, how he's supposed to progress. So I believe it was Friday that he got back off a mound against hitters. And mm-hmm. I think that was something like around 25 pitches. Uh, I know he threw a side yesterday. Uh, so then that would mean today would probably be a down day. And then he would likely pitch against hitters again on Wednesday. So, uh, you know, the Blue Jays could do that at the complex. They could do that at the Trop. Um, you know, obviously, the whole team's down here because they're starting against the Rays. So they could do that however they want. And so that would probably get him up to around 40, 45. See how he's feeling after that. If he's feeling good, he'll go through the process again, throw aside two days later and get back on a mound and try to stretch out to 60, 65, or 70. And he's just going to keep trying to get built up to that like 80, 85 pitch mark. Probably do that twice, and then if if he's feeling good, if everything's looking good, he could go out on a, a minor league rehab assignment. So he's not somebody who's going to be a factor until May, really, just because he's really had to just restart his spring training buildup. May. So, well, it's, yes. By the way, you know, it's, well, let's call it April. Let's call it April, shall we? Let's say it's April because it's, what, March 26th today? 26th? Yeah, nice. Look at me go knowing the date. That's pretty impressive stuff. Uh, it's March 26th today. So, yeah, we're looking at over a month. Over a month until there's real significant Alec Manoa stuff. Um, here's the second question I have when it comes to this. And this is probably one that should be answered later. But do you think there's, like, what has to happen for Manoa now to be the fifth starter? Does it have to be, like, obviously an injury could happen and then he ends up getting called up. He'd be the first guy up. But let's say everybody's healthy and Bowden Francis is pitching well, but also Manoa is pitching well. What happens then? Do you think? I know you're a reporter and you like to deal in facts, but let's play a little, you know, theory yeah. time. Come on, give me the, your theory. The hypotheticals. We don't love the hypotheticals. No, but this one, this one's, like this one's kind of like not the craziest hypothetical. You know, the, I'm, I'm not asking you to go off on a nutso limb here. Well, I mean, to get into May and have uh-huh. only used five starters. No, nope, that that's the caveat. I already went over that. I already went over that. They're healthy <laughs> like, here in this scenario. Everybody's yeah, healthy. That's unusual, though. That's yeah, okay. unlikely. Sure. Honestly, okay. Blue Jays to only use five starters by May. But in I this situation, it's it, it is. That. It was an unusual occurrence, <laughs> and it happened, and they're here, and this is now, and that is what is going down. Then they are going to have to make a difficult decision at that time based on the circumstances, based Coward. on health, based on performance. And I don't have enough information to know yeah, how they would make that decision. It's fine. That's fine. You That's... do whatever you little sneaky coward. I'm afraid to say it. I just don't want to say it. All right, fine. Next thing then. Let's deal with facts. What's the biggest story that we didn't talk about from spring? What was the most overlooked Ooh. thing? You know, I think that um, the the plate approaches up and down the lineup, and it is kind of like mm. granular, but like these are guys who are not chasing during spring and we like you can throw spring stats out the window right Mm -hmm. but and if you just order mlb spring stats by player right now the blue jays have like three or four players in the top 10 across baseball like they just they raked all spring um i don't put too much stock into that but i do put a lot of stock into the fact that the blue jays had super low chase rates across the team like you saw just Mm -hmm. really strong approaches up and down this lineup from you know guys who you expect to see that from you know whether that's like uh justin turner or or Kevin Biggio, two guys who work really good discerning plate appearances, but then also guys like Dalton Varsho, mm. um, guys like George Springer, you know, guys who were chasing a bit more often last year. Like you saw those guys take some very real steps in terms of just picking balls from strikes, not chasing pitchers' pitches. Vladimir Guerrero Jr., um, you know, like a lot of guys who really zoned up, really had an approach, had a plan, had a pitch on a particular area of the plate that they wanted to attack and did the work to get to that pitch. Like, that is what Don Mattingly has been preaching. So John Schneider has been preaching all spring. And look, you preach all spring, and then you see what happens in June and July. That's that's where the real test is, is whether you're doing it 
you know, two months from now when you're beat up and you're tired and you're in a slump and things aren't going your way and it's a day game after a night game and it's like 35 degrees outside, mm -hmm. are you going to do it then? That's mm -hmm. the real test. But the signs in spring of this team having a really discerning approach, a better approach than they had last year, those were really positive. Yeah, I was listening to Barker yesterday and – he was saying that basically the mantra from the team is that there isn't one set approach, but it's a do damage on what you can do damage on. Like Correct. that's the, yeah, that's the mantra. That's what they want to have. My, my question to you is on the follow-up of this is um, how much do you believe that's a, Hey, we got a pitching new pitching machine story or Hey, a guy got laser eye surgery versus that actually working when it comes to those days. We'll see. Like I, I am a big believer in swing decisions. Uh -huh. um, I'm a big believer in like having long competitive plate appearances. I think that has a lot of knock on impacts. Like even if you end up making an out, which you're likely to do like 65, 70% of the time at the big league level, if you make that out after six or seven pitches, if you just lean on that pitcher a bit longer, kind of like a boxer, you know, if you just kind of like wear them down a little bit, if you show your teammates, they're a bit more of their stuff. If you make their pitches a little bit less effective, if you can get into the bullpen a little bit earlier, like I think there are knock on impacts of just having a more professional approach. And I think at times last year, you saw the blue Jays just make too many outs on like the second or third pitch of a plate appearance when it was a pitcher's pitch, you know, mm -hmm. it's like one, one to Vladimir Guerrero jr. And he gets a change up or a two seamer in on his hands from a right hander uh, and hits a ground ball on it because that's mm -hmm. not the pitch he can barrel. That's not the pitch he can drive and do damage on. If anything, he needs to take that even if it's a strike, right? Like even if Angel Hernandez like jobs you behind the plate, take it, go one, two and try to get to something better that, that you can drive like battle with two strikes, certainly. But, you know, this is something that um, I think, like, I think there are just knock-on impacts of having that approach. And I think that ultimately that shows up in your batting average OBP and slugging percentage as a team. Uh, but it takes time to see those results. Like, you mm -hmm. really have to be consistent with that approach day in and day out over weeks and months. It can't just be a, oh, we're going to do this for the first two weeks of April thing, and then we're all going to start freelancing after that. No, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I think that, yeah, the hundred percent, definitely true. But when you were talking about like the process stuff, I was thinking last year, I don't know if people would quibble too much with Springer's approach um, as much as say, hey, maybe this guy has lost a step. I don't know if people would quibble too much with even Kirk's approach. Um, how much of that like really is just centered around Vlad that this is more of a Vladdy thing that's being spread to the rest of the team rather than an actual team philosophy that they needed for other guys. I think he could apply it to Springer as well. Like he got away from his pull power a lot. Last oh yeah. Year. I was so looking at those numbers. It was like a huge drop off. Right. So if he's attacking pitches that he should be attacking and pulling the ball better, he's, mm. he's just, even if he has lost a step, which is fair to expect as he gets to, you know, around 35 years old, yeah, he's still going to have pull power. Like he mm. still hits the ball really hard and he's still going to be able to clear the fences to the pull side. So if he's able to hit the ball in that direction a bit better and attack pitches that allow him to create that kind of contact in that direction better then his, his numbers should improve. I mean, Dalton Varsho, like another guy, right. Who just needs to be, and he's talked about this just a, a little more calm at the plate, you know, and not as sped up and not as jumpy and really needs to like stay within his mechanics, flatten out that bat path, not hit as many, you know, pop-ups and weak fly balls and really get to those pitches that he can turn on and, and hook um, over the right field wall. Like look at all those homers he hit in Arizona the year before um, he became a Blue Jay. Uh, it wasn't like a ton of oppo power. Like there's mm. a ton of pull power. So if he's able to get into that a bit better, I think that his home run numbers can increase. So Vlad's certainly a part of it, but I think there's other players who will benefit as well. In honor of Shohei Otani, I've set the line for Vladimir Guerrero Jr. home runs at 36 and a half. Uh, are you taking the over or the under? I'm asking this to everyone. Uh, probably the under. Probably the under. Okay. So, yeah. Because, yeah. like, 35 is a lot of home runs, yeah. right? Like, what well, has when's the last time you hit over 36 and a half? It's probably since Three. the MVP. Yeah, the MVP. Here, right? He had 32 and yeah. 28, 20, maybe less than 28. <laughs> I forget. Like, he was pretty good in 2022. Yeah. And uh, 30. he did not hit 37, right? Yeah, he what hit 32. 
Yeah. So yeah. I think that, yeah, I'll take the under on that, but that's uh-huh. more so just like, I think the line's probably set a bit high. Oh, wow. You're insulting the, the odds maker. That's rude. That's <laughs> I was saying there's a lot of hype around Vladdy and basically to me, okay. Yeah, you know, I'm doing now we'll do Jay's story of the season because I was doing this with, you know, Ben and Ben Ennis picked Vladdy. And I went, yeah, that's right to me. But to me, it's like Vladdy is the head of the snake of the bigger story, which is, yeah, it's positive regression. How much of this is just going to be these guys getting normal to can these guys actually be a good offense? Like, what are they really now? Now that they've doubled down on this group, what are they going to be? Uh, was this just a weird clutch stat team that couldn't find one? If the approach tweak happens and Vladdy is just good, what can the offense be? If they get a better year from Kirk, a better year from Varsho, like normal years from those guys, what does the offense look like? Is that the story for you? Because, yeah, I feel like if you're a Blue Jays fan, you're being a Blue Jays optimist, kind of the number one thing you need to believe that this team is going to be special is special Vladdy, a guy that would be hitting 36 home runs. I agree with you, but I would narrow it to even just the top three guys in the batting order, just yeah. Springer, Bichette, and Vlad. Like, if you get, uh, you know, a bounce back for Alejandro Kirk, like, that's great. You'll yeah. take that. That's wonderful. If Dalton Varsho plays closer to his obvious potential, great, amazing. You'll take that. But the real, like, drivers of this offense and of this team are going to be the top three, Springer, mm-hmm. Bichette, and Guerrero. Those are the three who made the most played appearances last year. So those are the three who had the biggest impact um, on the team's offense last year, which obviously was underwhelming. Uh, and because, look, two of those three, like, had down years and had unimpressive years uh, relative to what they're clearly capable of. So Bo Bichette was great, and I think that he'll take another step this year. Mm-hmm. I think he could win a batting title this year. I think he could be an MVP finalist this year, honestly. I think Bo's going to have a tremendous season, but it takes more than just one great player to have a great offense. Like, you need two or three great players. So if George Springer can be obviously he's not gonna be peak george springer from the astros days but mm-hmm. if he can be better than he was last year that's huge and then if vlad can get back to 2022 vlad like look 2021 vlad like might be an outlier that he that might be the peak the best mm-hmm. season he ever has but if he can get back to 2022 version of himself mm-hmm. that's a really 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 good player and so I, I think as those three go the toronto blue jays offense will go i'm i'm buying fully the bow thing I'm buying more of the Vladdy thing of being closer to the 2022 version. The George Springer having a 732 OPS in his age, you know, 33 season, him entering his age 34 season, making that much money. That that playing kind of the fit for him too, seemingly having to be out in the field more than we maybe anticipated he would have to down the stretch of his career. That's the one that I'm having a hard time seeing. Yeah, and typically in the back half of these like long free agent deals for outfielders, you don't see the best years of those deals, right? Mm-hmm. George Springer is getting into the back half of that year. He's going to be 35. Like you can, you know, there are a lot of cautionary tales out there of mid 30s outfielders who were super productive in their uh-huh. mid to late 20s, even early 30s. And then, uh, yeah, dropped off rather considerably as they got to their mid 30s. So, look, all, what I can say of George Springer is that, like, he is putting in the work to have a better season. He was in, like, Dunedin. As much as anybody, like it was Jordan Romano and George Springer were the two guys who I was told mm. were like at the complex the most over the winter. And, you know, Springer lives in Tampa, so it's easy for him. But I mean, he's driving in every day to do the work with the strength staff, with the hitting folks, making some mechanical tweaks, trying to put his body in a good position to repeat the substantial workload that he carried last year and perhaps be more productive through it and not have that workload impact his production if it did. Mm last year so he, he's putting in the work to do it he's motivated um like he's got to go out and show it because look he's like the highest paid guy on the team right like he's the highest paid player in franchise history he's, he mm. makes 25 million dollars a year so uh the blue jays are you know paying for more than george springer showed last year he, he can't have another year like last year where he was like a 102 ops guy like you need him to be obviously it's not gonna be 140 150 like it was in his prime but mm-hmm. you need him to be you know up over 120 to be getting the most out of your leadoff hitter. Mm, uh, yeah. I'm dubious. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. But yeah, he's the number one guy. Like I'm actually optimistic about Varsho because I think that it was so bad last year that it's got to be better. And you look at the home road splits and I go, yeah, just this weirdness. There, there had to be some weirdness there. I actually think that Kirk um, is 
really important to hit, not just to be the the defensive guy for this offense to look good. Like I think that they need one of those two guys to actually emerge and provide more support than just leaning on the idea that Justin Turner is going to be some massive upgrade from what they got from Brandon belt last year. But yeah, the, the George Springer thing to me feels like if I was doing my top list of concerns and maybe this ends up looking stupid, he's sneaky high just because of that money, just because of that role, just because they, they, they can't move him off the, the lead off spot, right? This isn't someone that they can end up going, huh, you know, we're going to mess with you. Otherwise he's not running down to first base and getting benched like he was last year. I'm just, that one has real dynamite potential to me. Um, but speaking of the batting order, this is my last one for you about these guys. Are we sure it's going to be one, two, three, those, those three guys, because there has been a little buzz over the last couple of days. And this came from Schneider himself about the potential of Bo hitting in the cleanup spot. So I could see Bo hitting third. I could see it going Springer, Vlad, Bo. Mm -hmm. I don't think that Bo will hit cleanup out of the gate because Bo wants to bat in the first inning. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bo wants it to be consistent and he wants to bat in the first inning. So Mm -hmm. that pretty much limits you to three batting order positions and you're not going to move George Springer out of the leadoff spot because George Springer uh, believes he's a leadoff hitter. So George Springer is going to lead off. And I think that the Blue Jays look at um, who they want up with runners on and who they want up in run producing situations and I think they lean towards Bo Bichette right now. So that's why I think you'll likely see Springer, Vlad, Bo. And I think they think there's some, mm. even though I'm not the biggest lineup protection guy, I think they feel there's some benefit to having Springer ahead of Vlad and then Bo behind them. Springer, Vlad, Bo. That's tough for my 36 and a half home runs projection. That tells me that they're like under as well. You know, that's that moved the line. <laughs> that moved you the can l- hit a home run from anywhere in the batting. Sure, but I'm just, what is that impact? Yeah, I'm just telling you that that moved the line from 36 and a half. Uh, if you bought the under at 36 and a half, like Arden Zwilling did, congratulations, because the under has now moved <laughs> to 34 and a half with Vladdy potentially being moved into the two hole. That's exactly what ended up happening. Uh, Shohei Otani, obviously he was on it early. Uh, hey brother. Oh, wait. Um, Last thing, La- the actual last thing. Is there anything I missed? Sure. Is there anything uh, like, you know, cause you're the hipster guy and I always have to get your kind of like hipster storyline thing. And I know you talked about uh, the damage and you know, the team's approach, but I actually feel like that's becoming a little more mainstream. That's a little bit more of a mainstream answer from you. But is there anything right now that you're looking at and you're like, mm, you know what, this particular thing or this particular player, this is the hipster narrative, or this is the hipster player that you're looking forward to. Like you're going to buy into Ernie Clement, right? Like you... Like where, what's, who's your guy? Ooh, who is my guy on this team? I don't, you know, who's like my, guy? I mean, Ernie Clement could be like a Stephen Kwan type, which is like, that's pretty good. If he's guy. that, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. For an Ernie, I mean, the guy makes, you can't get a pitch by him, right? Like he's makes such insane amounts of contact. Um, and the Blue Jays have done some things with the swing path hmm. in order to just get that contact off the ground a bit and get a bit more line drive. Uh, and he's been doing damage this spring. He's had a much better approach this spring too. Like he's really bought into that approach stuff we were talking about Mm. of like getting your pitch in your part of the zone. Like the gift and the curse of his contact ability is that like he can literally make contact with anything. And that includes pitches well off the plate. And he often has made pitches, uh, contact on those pitches. And that's just not how you get extra base hits at the big league level. So, um, I think if he like blends that better approach with some of the swing pass stuff that he has improved on, I think that he could be, yeah, he could be Steven Quinn. One. and like the other thing is he's mm. fast as hell like he's probably the quickest guy on the team so mm, like that, that, that plays mean, in though? i mean he's probably the quickest guy on the team <laughs> yeah. honestly like, no i know i'm just saying <laughs> so, that like it's not exactly this is a team with vogelbach and vladdy and george springer and you know they almost brought joey Votto up <laughs> like although that seems right done so his sprint speeds yeah. league wide though are, yeah oh, okay okay there, there we go that's better percentage. give me the league wide over one, yeah. He's up over 29 feet per second regularly. So like 30 is elite. So he is like borderline elite speed. So it's, he hasn't, look, speed is an attribute and base stealing is a skill. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't really shown the skill to Mm -hmm. this point of base stealing, but he has the attribute of speed, which can show up in other ways, you know, first, third, second to home on weak contact you're reaching base more often because you're putting pressure on defenses. Like that does show up in results. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be a big base stealer. That does just doesn't seem to be his skill, but I think the attribute plays to me, like the biggest thing this season, honestly, and it's not even any singular player. It's that the blue Jays need better stories coming out of their development system. Like they need to be doing mm-hmm. a better job of developing like last year, Davis Schneider, 
was the one good story that they had come out of their system. And he played 35 games, maybe, right? Um, like the Blue Jays just need to be doing a better job of identifying talent um, in the draft, amateur wise, also internationally. And then they have to be doing a better job of developing it once they get it in. Like you can go back to the 2022 draft. And when you see like the Yankees who are picking right after the Blue Jays, getting a Spencer Jones and like a Drew Thorpe, like right after the Blue Jays took players who have not um, risen to those, like to the highs that those guys have in terms of prospect lists, which obviously is dubious, but uh, that's not a good look. Um, when David Schneider's the one good, like the one player providing upward pressure on your big league roster, like that's not good enough. You need an Arelvis Martinez pr- providing that pressure. You need an Alan Roden, a Damiano Palma Gianni. Like mm-hmm. you need some of these guys to start pushing up towards the big leagues so that as players like George Springer age out and Kevin Gosman, some of the, you know, Kevin Kiermaier, some of the other veterans on this team, as some of the younger players who are ticketed for free agency and are likely to, or possible to depart this, this franchise via free agency leave, mm-hmm. you need that upward pressure. You need legitimate two to three win big leaguers coming from within to help replace that talent. Otherwise you are looking at some very lean years ahead. So I talked to Jeff Ponce of baseball America about this. Um, do you know him? Uh, New Hampshire guy, right? Yes. So yes, he, he, very, I don't know him personally, but yeah, I know his work, but very, clo- covers the team very closely. Big prospect guy. One of my favorite guys that I've spoken with and yeah, about prospects. It's like, He's been on it, on and on it. He and Kylie McDaniel are like my two favorites to kind of pick the brain of because they actually know what they're talking about. His assessment was that the Jays have a real philosophical problem of taking guys that don't have high enough ceilings and are supposed to be floor players, and yet they've missed also hitting what they thought were the floors. And so to me, it's like, okay, um, they need to be able to hit on some of those dudes. They need some of those stories to emerge. They need some of you know what you're talking about that – that upward pressure, I'm just, I don't think that that's coming this year. Like, I feel like they either have to change that philosophy and it's going to be something that has a trickle down effect a couple of years from now, like the Arjun Niemela kid who seemingly does have more of the boomer bust potential. Like that was one of those picks, but I don't, yeah, I just don't see how this is going to happen around this core over the next season. Like that's not a story to me this year in terms of what is we're going to see on the roster. That feels more of a story of what you could see down below. Hopefully do you agree with that I mean, assessment? Spencer Jones was like a third or fourth year college guy out of Vanderbilt. Yeah. Like that's, you know, that that's a huge miss. Like mm-hmm. um, Drew Thorpe as well, a college guy who mm-hmm. you know went right after the Blue Jays picked like that. Again, that's a big miss in 2022. So um, like, like I think they could have some more, some better stories this year, like particularly like Erelvis Martinez, if he goes to AAA and demonstrates some of the strides he made in terms of swing decisions yeah, last that. year and, like keeps the strikeout rate down and the walk rate up. Like that's, that's your guy or Elvis who could have like the babe Schneider arc this mm-hmm. year where he comes up in the middle of summer to fill in for somebody who's hurt and puts up just a gang of extra base hits and homers in a very short amount of time. Like his power is as real as anybody's in the minors. He has the most homers in the minors for the last three years. And he's only 22. Like the other guys who are on that list are all like 25, 26. So like if if he can show up and if he can be real, that's huge. Obviously, Ricky Tiedemann, who's going to be on this team at some point, if he stays mm-hmm. healthy, if he keeps making progress. Like you said, Arjun Namala is like further off, but he's one of those more risky type of mm-hmm. picks, one of those more upside plays. We'll see what he becomes, but you're not going to see him until like 2026. Yeah. He's what, 19? Is he 18? Yeah, he's, like he's young. He's a, he's a literal a teenager. He'll, yeah. he'll be younger than some guy, a lot of guys who are drafted this year. So I think that like Martinez, Tiedemann and Alan Roden are like yeah. the three who you would really like to show up as positive stories this year. Arden Zwelling at the letters reporter for Sportsnet, all around, just everything. Call him as, uh, Mr. Baseball here. Thanks for doing this, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, man. Be well. See you, bud.